The U.S. Supreme Court has once again intervened in the Second Amendment, this time dealing a loss to firearm advocates. But what happened here? Because did we have one of the U.S. Supreme Court justices flip sides? Did we go from a 5-4 to a 9-0 against? What's going on? We're going to be breaking that all down. But first, the very real giveaway. It's going on right now. It's super secret. Not allowed to go into it, but it may go and fit into a holster. You may conceal, carry it around somewhere. And yes, it is very real. I see these questions all the time. I have met multiple people who have come up and told me, I have won this. This is real. It does check out. So be sure to check that out in the description box below. You don't want to miss it. But guys, my name's Tom Grieve, ex-state prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Let's get into it. What we're talking about is we're talking about the rule that was passed on April 26th of 2022. That's the ATF so-called frame receiver rule. In a nutshell, understand this. Congress defined what is constituted as a firearm legally. The ATF, which is one of 400 some odd agency sub agencies like the EPA, the IRS and so forth, they have delegated executive power to basically try to interpret Congress's statutes. OK, so they're allowed to interpret, but they're not allowed to exceed the scope of the statute. And that's what the plaintiffs here, that's Vanderstock, are suing over is, among other things, has the ATF exceeded their statutory scope by saying, look, you know what? For decades, we've defined a firearm that is 80 percent complete or more as now being a firearm. But now we're entirely changing decades of basically not only jurisprudence from the court's perspective, but also interpretation. And now we're changing to something totally different. And it's not different in a small way. It's different in a big way. Because fundamentally, what we're talking about here, what we're getting at is when is a gun a gun? When is a firearm a firearm? If I'm going to be taking a hunk of plastic, let's say, and if I'm going to be machining that out or a hunk of aluminum, whatever the case may be, I'm going to be machining it out to turn it into the receiver or the frame, depending on if we're talking about a rifle, shotgun, handgun, so forth. But basically, kind of that hull, if this is Mr. Potato Head, that we plug all the other things into, the trigger, the magazine, if applicable, the barrel, and so forth. In other words, what's the hull that basically you need in order to put all the meat on? What's the structure to put all the meat on, so to speak? At what point does that chunk of plastic turn into that firearm? Because it doesn't start as a firearm. If I just had this block of plastic, say the size of a shoebox, and if I said, hey, you know, someday I'm gonna turn this block of plastic into a firearm, does my intent suddenly change that block of plastic, which is in no way, shape, or form a firearm? Let's say it's basically a shoebox. Is that now a firearm because I have the intention to turn it into a firearm? That's in essence what we're talking about here. Does my intention plus in being in possession of some tools or jig suddenly turn something that is obviously not a firearm into a firearm? And if we're gonna be taking that step, who has the authority to make that call? Does that need to come from Congress since it's a reasonably radical departure from every way that we've understood, litigated, and basically prosecuted possession of firearm cases in the entire history and tradition of the United States? Or are we going to allow a non-elected administrative agency to make that call? That's basically what this boils down to, is when does a gun become a gun and who's allowed to make that call? All right. So on June 30th of 2023, so this year, the Northern District Court of Texas, which is one of the federal trial courts, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about district courts. We're talking about trial courts where trials happen. So a judge there, a frequent flyer to this channel, Judge Reed O'Connor, vacated the rule. In other words, said, we're done. This rule is bad. It is no good. The ATF has exceeded their statutory decision-making ability because it exceeds their, their powers delegated to them. And again, long form of that linked in the description box below. So the government appealed from the District Court of Texas, from the federal trial court, up to the federal Fifth Circuit. So there's 13 different circuits of appeal. So you go from federal trial court to the circuit court all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Those are basically the layers that we're talking about here. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals basically agreed to fast track the case, but they did not undo or stay the district court's ruling entirely, but they did in part. The plaintiffs only challenged part of the rule, so long story short is that basically the Fifth Circuit more or less reinstated certain parts of that 
not going to get lost in the weeds of that right now. They set the oral arguments for September 7th. So the Fifth Circuit largely backed up what the Northern District Court of Texas did. Then on July 27th, the Biden administration goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. So they went from the, the district court to the Fifth Circuit all the way up to SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, and told the justices that while the judge's opinion in the trial court order remained in effect, ghost guns can be sold, ghost guns, their words, not mine, can be sold without being subject to federal firearm laws. Quote, unquote, the damage is done, end quote, they argued. Law enforcement officials will not be able to trace those ghost guns in the future. By contrast, the administration argued, allowing the ATF to enforce the rule while the appeal continued will not harm the manufacturers of ghost guns, kits, and parts, which of course is a bit of a joke because, well, so many reasons. But they simply said, look, all these people have to do is simply comply with, quote, with the same straightforward and inexpensive administrative requirements that apply to commercial sales of all other firearms, end quote. I wonder if you talk to my friend, Mike Kwiatkowski, who was on the channel the other day, ffl-expert.com, how easy and inexpensive those administrative requirements are, if he would agree with that. Neither here or there right now. This request was joined by 20 democratically controlled states via the attorney generals as well as the District of Columbia. Now we get to August 8th, 2023. This is where U.S. Supreme Court actually put a stay on the June 30th, 2023 order that vacated the frame receiver rule. So in other words, they said, look, that's no longer good. We're taking that out of effect. We're pressing pause on that. And they said that our pause button will last until this whole case is basically done. So whether this goes to the Fifth Circuit, up to the US Supreme Court, but until this case is more or less done, I say more or less because the wording is a little bit more technical. You can check out the link for that ruling in the description box below as well. But basically, look, we're, we're pausing this. And I will note here, because we're going to circle back to this later, that four of the nine justices dissented and said that, look, we would not make this ruling. And it was noted in that, that brief order. The justices who did not agree with the order were Justices Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh, meaning that if we're counting the conservatives as the people who presumably would be pro-Second Amendment, at least based on prior voting lines, we would have two people, Chief Justice John Roberts, as well as Justice Amy Coney Barrett, presumably flipped to create a 5-4 anti-Second Amendment majority, at least in this instance. Now, shortly after the Supreme Court's August 8th order, two of the original challengers, Blackhawk Manufacturing as well as Defense Distributed, returned to the district court, seeking an injunction that would bar the government from enforcing the rule against them, while while the appeal continued. O'Connor, that's the federal court judge, the trial judge who initially vacated the rule entirely, granted the request. So they granted an injunction, which is not the same as vacating the entire appeal for a nation. It's simply saying, look, we're granting the injunction as it applies to these manufacturers on September 14th. And the Fifth Circuit actually upheld that on October 2nd. Now you're caught up in the backstory, which is very confusing. Then the Biden administration returned to the Supreme Court three days later on October 5th, asking the justices to intervene once more. The Supreme Court's August 8th order, the administration argued, quote, reflects an authoritative determination that the government should be allowed to implement the rule during the appellate proceedings, end quote. If the Supreme Court does not block the trial court's order, in this case, the injunction the administration warned, quote, untraceable ghost guns will remain widely available to anyone with a computer and a credit card, no background check required, end quote. And more broadly, the administration added, the court could step in because the lower courts, quote, have effectively countermanded this court's authoritative determination, end quote, that the Biden administration should be able to enforce the rule nationwide while its appeal continues. Now, Defense Distributed, that's one of the manufacturers, countered this argument in the U.S. Supreme Court, saying that, look, the federal trial court is not countermanding your orders. The original rule that the U.S. Supreme Court intervened on before was vacating, in other words, smacking down the entire frames receiver rule. This was not that. This is simply an injunction that was being put in place that was narrowly tailored to basically protect two of the plaintiffs in the case. Nothing more, nothing less. In light of this difference, Blackhawk emphasized the company had no choice but to go back to the district court to seek relief to preserve its ability to stay in business, at least until the litigation was concluded. Then on October 6th, 
Justice Samuel Alito, and that's the justice who handles the emergency appeals that originate from the Fifth Circuit, issued a temporary stay of Judge O'Connor's ruling granting the injunction until 5 p.m. on October 16th to give the Supreme Court time to basically meet and to consider the Biden administration's request. And then in a brief unsigned order issued shortly before 4.30 yesterday afternoon on Monday, October 16th, the justices vacated O'Connor's order, clearing the way for the Biden administration to enforce the rule against Black Hawk and Defense Distributed, at least for the time being. As a note, there were no public dissents from the court's order this time. Guys, be sure to hit that like button. And also, don't forget about that special giveaway that's going on right now. And it ends really, really soon. I have met people who have won these things. It is very, very real. Be sure to check it out in the description box below. So Justice Alito handles the emergency appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He granted this, but it looks like he may have granted it in concert with consultation with the other judges, and there were no public dissenting judges. What's going on here? Did he seemingly flip to now join and create a 6-3 anti-2-8 majority, at least where we're talking about the so-called ghost gun frame receiver rule? Maybe he flipped because he saw this as an end around what the court did and wanted to maintain something resembling judicial integrity. That's, I think, one theory on this, meaning we don't want to let other courts countermand the spirit of what the U.S. Supreme Court has done based on some sort of technicality, where before we're talking about vacating a rule and now we're talking about an injunction. Maybe another theory is that he didn't flip. The other five judges who were the original majority maintained the majority, and he simply said, look, I'm more or less the hand here. I'm just going to keep this going because that's what the other five said. Maybe there were no dissenting opinions. That's the reason why there were none noted, and it's 9-0. Maybe that's a fourth opinion here. Or maybe if he did flip, did he flip because the burden for an injunction deals with the chances of ultimate success on the merits? Because again, we're talking about an injunction this time around to the Supreme Court, whereas last time we were talking about an actual final judge's order. So we have to keep in mind the burden of proof for an injunction includes, among other things, what are the plaintiff's ultimate chance for success? And here, maybe knowing the insider baseball, so to speak, look, we've got 5-4 or perhaps worse against. I'm not so sure this is going to succeed. Therefore, at least for the purposes of an injunction, the plaintiffs aren't going to get there. And this could be a subtle nod to that. What combination of these theories do you think is right? Let us know in the comment field below. Either way, let's take a look at some of the statistics on where these so-called crime guns come from because the entire case that the Biden administration made was largely premised on a false notion that somehow we have an airtight system and that if we allow the so-called frame receiver rule to not go into effect, that's just gonna flood the streets with untraceable firearms as opposed to right now where, hey, the system works, bad guys can't get any guns because we all know that's the way it's working, right? Not really the case. A 2019 Department of Justice study found that 43% of so-called crime guns, in other words, firearms that turned up at the scenes of crime or traced back from scenes of crime, were purchased on the black market, so an underground market. 6% of so-called crime guns were stolen. 10% were lawful retail purchases. Less than 1% came from some sort of private transfer, at least originating from some sort of so-called gun show loophole. And by the way, that was technically 0.8% and that 0.8% fell by 50%, fell by half over the last 15 to 20 years. 11% came from straw purchases or suspected straw purchases and 15% were given from a friend or relative. Moreover, a recent national survey of prison inmates between the ages of 18 to 40 published by the Preventative Medicine found that only one in 10 so 10% bought the firearm involved in the act that resulted in them being jailed. So only one in 10. So somehow if we have all these firearms go through a dealer, what kind of good is that gonna do? What kind of good? And by the way, you don't have to take my word for it. Here's what a few experts on the subject say. I'm gonna quote an ATF agent who said this, quote, let's be honest. If someone wants a gun, it's obvious the person will not have difficulty in buying a gun, either legally or through the extensive United States black market, end quote. Realistically, all this is going to do is basically take firearms out of the good guy's hands. If you want to see more statistics about where these so-called crime guns are turning up, let us know in the comment field below. Thanks for sticking around. Don't forget about the secret giveaway going on right now. We will see you in the next one.